Hi guys, welcome to the channel of love. Okay, I thought it would be a, a good time. I'm perched on the edge of my seat. There's Jasper's, he's asleep, behind me. <clears throat> I'm still a little bit breathless. That's coming in with today's reading. So, um, but I do want to get on with oneness. Okay. Which I believe is chapter three. Oneness. You are at once a beating heart and a single heartbeat in the body called humanity. Now, I don't believe we started this chapter. <clears throat> no. Okay. It's been a while. Let's get back to some studying. We're going to take it nice and easy. Okay. Take a few moments to study the word universe, the term that we use to describe this immense world of form in which we find ourselves thinking and breathing day in and day out. Breaking the word down, we have uni, meaning one, and verse, a song, one song. That is our universe, my friends, just one song. No matter how separate into individual little notes, we are all still involved in the one song. This is one of the most difficult concepts for us to grasp and apply to our daily lives because we believe so strongly in our separateness. We recognise ourselves as one unit functioning separately among billions of others we identify exclusively with our own mind as unique and separate from everyone else's on our planet. We look out from our separateness and believe that through it is the only way to interact with the world and our reality. A huge shift is required in our consciousness to include the universal principle of oneness. Once we make that shift and begin to recognise all of humanity as a beautifully harmonious song, magnificent changes take place in our individual lives. But to make the shift, you will need to suspend beliefs resulting from the narrow perspective of a personal life history and instead begin to think about yourself in relationship to everyone else who shares this planet now who has ever been here before, and even more strikingly, who will show up in the future. <clears throat> A new perspective on our place in this one song. Albert Einstein, a man I consider perhaps the greatest mind of our century, wrote these words regarding the perspective I'm asking you to examine. A human being is a part of the whole called by us universe, a part limited in time and space. He experiences himself, his thoughts and feelings as something separated from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. This delusion is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to our personal desires and to affection for a few persons nearest to us. Our task must be must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole nature in its beauty. Einstein was much more than a scientist. He was a deep thinking metaphysician meta with little or no regard for the established ways of thinking and doing. In the words I have quoted, Einstein offers us a challenge to free ourselves from our cages and to see how we are all connected, not only in a spiritual or astral sense, but in a linear, physical, real world sense as well. I have my own way of making this concept take shape for me. First, to get a perspective for dealing with metaphysical matters, I ask myself, can I get back far enough 
to see the entire picture. I visualise being able to stand in a place and literally see the entire scope of creation. Since this is impossible to do in form, I try to look in the other direction, that is, towards the tiniest speck and to magnify what is inside that speck, and so on to infinity. Victor Hugo put it like this, where the telescope ends, the microscope begins. Which of the two has the grander view? So I suggest that you temporarily put away the telescope on the entire one song and take a look inward at the one thing you know the most about, your own body. Here we will see we are all an I that is we, to borrow a phrase from Richard Moss's marvellous book of that title. Let's take a look through this metaphorical microscope. We are teeming with life forms, most of which are necessary to keep us in a state of aliveness. Our eyelids have many tiny organisms that work in harmony with the whole. The lining of our large intestines has hundreds of different kinds of microbes all alive, all with their own unique characteristics, yet still very much a part of the whole person. Our scalp is home for tiny organisms, each one of which has a separate identity that can be examined with a powerful microscope. So too our liver, pancreas, toenails, skin, heart, and on and on are brimming with life, all working in harmony with a whole that we call me. Yes, indeed, you and I are a me that is we. And though those microscopic life forms that reside inside our toenails will very likely never come into contact with those other very different life forms that live in our eyeballs, they are both separate and unique and crucial to the survival of the totality that we call us out. This became abundantly clear for me when I saw a documentary, a documentary on the life forms living within one raindrop. With a very powerful microscope, scientists documented that there were hundreds of life forms in each raindrop, many of which had no physical contact with the other life forms in the same drop. They were of different colours, shapes and origins, each with unique physical characteristics and were as far away from one another as we are from tribesmen in Afghanistan. Yet, they all compose a totality called raindrop. In an endless universe, it is conceivable that our physical size is proportionately the same as that of the tiniest microbe within the tiniest microbe, within the even tinier microbe, or within that drop of rain. The infinity tiny life form that resides within my toenails will never make physical contact with the tiny microbes in the inner lining of my retina in my eye, in that eye socket on the head of my torso and infinitum. At the same time, it is separate, unique part of the totality known as person. From this perspective, we can contemplate ourselves as a person in relation to the totality known as universe. With our narrow vision, we can see that we are connected at the physical level and we can validate that this physical measurement methods, okay, and we can validate this with physical measurement methods. <clears throat> but we tend to use those measuring sticks, which we have invented as instruments to enslave us to a confining and narrow inter interpretation of our place in the one song. We do this by believing that reality is only what we are capable of measuring, rather than both what we can measure and what is still unmeasurable. Germs and bacteria existed in our lives and bodies long before we could examine them under the microscope. The invention of the microscope did not create the germs, just as we have created devices to measure what was previously there, but unmeasurable, 
so too it is possible and for me probable that each of us is a part of a we that is unmeasurable by contemporary man-made technology. If we think of all humanity as one being and ourselves as individual pieces of the gigantic being and if somehow we could manage to get back far enough to see this entire life form we would notice immediately if one part of the being was missing our eyes would automatically go to the empty space. That space shows how important each of us is. You and I make the body of humanity complete. If we are not fully alive and working in harmony with the entire body, it lacks harmony and balance. And if enough of us are missing, the body will die. This is the perspective we must take in order to understand and begin to live the principle of oneness. It is, of course, a paradox to be unique and all one at the same time. Nevertheless, it is our reality, and once we know how this principle of oneness works in this endless universe, we will begin to see how we can make the principle work not only for each of us, but for this entire song that we make up. The harmony will be felt within you, and it will radiate out to make the one song a rapturous melody, totally in tune, harmonising with all of the individual notes that make up this universe. Let me tell you what a personal difference it has made for me in every aspect of my life. Okay, that's a lot to get your head around. My mother's mother holds a very special place in my heart. Sorry, this is Wayne Dyer's My First Contact with Oneness. My mother's mother holds a very special place in my heart. When my mother was beset by so many difficulties after my father abandoned us, my grandparents took my oldest brother to live with them. And from my grandmother's role as a mother, I got my first inkling of the concept of unity and oneness. My grandmother had nursed each of her children and had been extremely protective of her young, including my mother. She had spent most of her time lovingly rocking, singing, cuddling and caring for her infants. My grandmother was in her 94th year when she began to lose some of her physical faculties. She needed constant help and care as she approached the age of 95. I watched my mother taking care of her in those final days of my grandmother's life. I watched as my mother took clean clothes to her mother and made absolutely certain that her undergarments were never soiled. And one day I watched my mother holding my grandmother and peeling a banana for her and actually mushing it up in her own mouth and massaging her mother's neck to help her swallow it. Then she helped her put on clean underclothes. She rocked her mother and talked to her almost as if she were a baby. As I watched, I asked myself the question that was swirling around in my head. Who is the mother and who is child? Didn't my now helpless child grandmother once change the diapers of the mother child and mush up her food to make sure that she was properly nourished? Weren't these two human beings really fulfilling the same role for each other? The oneness of it all struck me in an, in an astonishing way as I watched this scene. I realised it's all one big circle. I realised it is all one big circle, just as the universe is one big circle. And while we tend to identify ourselves with separateness, when we can get a, get a different perspective, we see that it is all one and that there exists in the one song a large being called human being and that each of us is born into that being. My second encounter with this oneness concept came when I began to read some of the literature on collective consciousness. I had read Ken Key's The Hundredth Monkey and I was trying to put it 
into a personally meaningful context. Very briefly, the hundredth monkey is a theory about how all of us within a species affect one another. A group of monkeys were being studied off the coast of Japan and one monkey within the group began washing his sweet potatoes in a certain way in the salt water. Soon all of the monkeys began mimicking this monkey and doing the same thing. When a given number of the monkeys behaved in this fashion, the same behaviour began to appear in a group of monkeys hundreds of miles away, even though the two groups had had no physical contact with each other. The hundredth monkey symbolised what scientists call the critical mass within the species. It is theorised theorized that once a critical mass number is reached, the same behaviour begins to show up in all of the other members of the same species. It seems to be true for all species that when a given critical mass of its numbers begins to think or act in a certain way, so does every other member of that same species. In Ken Key's book, he uses the example of nuclear war and suggests that if enough of us as members of the human species believe and act as if there will ultimately be a nuclear war, then we will reach that critical mass. We will, of course, create our own reality as a species. On the other hand, if enough of us believe and act as if such an occurrence were impossible, then we can create that reality for our entire species as well. The invisible connection between all members of a species is more verifi verifiable now than it was a few years ago. Physicists describe it as a phase transition. Scientists report that when atoms within a molecule align in a certain way and a critical mass number is reached, the rest of the atoms spontaneously line up the same way. Nick Herbert's Quantum Reality, Fritjof Capra's The Tao of Physics, Gary Zukav's The Dancing Ruli Masters, Lewis Thomas's The Lives of a Cell, and Rupert Sheldrake's A New Science of Life are a few of the books in the growing literature describing a connection between the principles of physics <clears throat> and a collective consciousness. Just imagine, just imagine the staggering implications of this fledging scientific notion, a scientific basis for the oneness of it all, and the idea that if enough, enough of us who share this life form called human being, begin to think and act in harmonious and loving ways, we can affect the entire being, called human being. The entire history of the human being is filled with war and disorder. How many mothers have wept for sons who have gone off to fight one war or another over the centuries? An endless cascade of terror and division marks this being that we call human being. And you have shown up in it. Do you support the divisions that have become a part of this being's history? Or can you be the one voice affecting the voice next to you? And so on, until we reach that critical mass where the entire being will align itself with the harmony that is the one song. It is only the human being that has been out of harmony with the best of the totality that is God, or oneness, or whatever we choose to call it. When the individuals within this total being align in a certain fashion, much like the atoms within a given molecule, then they can affect all of the beings within the one human being. I have heard scientists in virtually all fields of study talk about how the invisible forces that connect or members of species. They report how when liquid matter crystallises on one part of the planet, the same crystallisation process occurs 
almost simultaneously in another spot without information or physical contact. I have heard researchers talk about microbes in Europe suddenly behaving differently, while microbes on other parts of the globe demonstrate this new behaviour almost simultaneously without an exchange of information. The entire history of the human being seems to follow these unwritten rules of a collective consciousness. I am not trying to make a case here for the scientific verification of this point of view, but to show that the idea of oneness enjoys credibility in scientific circles as a means of explaining what has previously been scientifically inexplicable. Certainly, if enough of us begin to think in non-aggressive, harmonious ways to reach a critical mass, there could be an end to war. As each being reacted harmoniously rather than with enmity toward the being adjacent to him, it would not be long before there would be no soldiers to follow the orders of the generals. Harmony would begin to verberate in those who design the weapons of destruction. When the designers stop creating weapons, government officials would stop contracting to purchase weapons of destruction and the spin-off effects would begin to be felt in all fields of human endeavour. People who transport weapons will find this behaviour inconsistent with their own internal harmony and would simply refuse to participate. Advertisers would begin to feel the pressure to align on the side of harmony rather than of tumult. The transition would work within the human being, much as it does within a molecule, as more and more align in harmony. The pressure becomes overwhelming and the oneness of humanity is the winner. And how does it all start? Symbolically, with that one monkey picking up that sweet potato and having the courage to behave differently, and then the next, until the critical mass is reached. One person with a conscience actually becomes a majority through this collective consciousness process. I was running one day and thinking about this business of myself being a I that is we, when I noticed another runner about 30 yards ahead of me, and I asked myself a question that was to be a life-changing event for me. How can I possibly be connected to that being whom I've never seen before and don't know from Adam, and yet who seems to be doing the same thing I am doing? Then I remembered the question of perspective. I thought about my feet moving one in front of the other and all of the life forms that are alive in and on me. That will never see one another and yet inextricably connected and essential to make up this being that I call Wayne. I decided to project myself back far enough and I realised for the first time that 30 yards in physical distance was absolutely nothing in an endless one song that we measure in the distances that light travels in years. The other runner was no farther away from me than the microbe in my eye was from the one in my pancreas. For the first time in my life, I saw myself connected to a being who previously seemed separated from me. It became crystal clear to me that regardless of where any of us is on the globe, given a world that is round, it is impossible to choose upsides. I saw that we are literally all part of this being that we showed up in, with a mode of behaviour and a personality all its own, and that each of us within that being can make a difference in how the totality proceeds and exists. One small voice within that one song can influence the entire being towards destruction or harmony. It just hit me that day, and then when I got home and began to talk to my wife about this amazing realisation, I opened a letter from a woman in Iran, a letter that was to crystallise it all for me. An English-speaking person in Iran had read several of my books 
and had decided to translate them into Farsi, Farsi, and make them available to the peoples of Iran. She had translated the books and actually had 5,000 copies of each book circulated and then had elected to go into a second printing. At that point, the government decided to place a disclaimer in the book stating that my subversive ideas were inconsistent with the philosophy of the revolution taking place in Iran. The niece of the translator got my address through the American publisher and wrote to me that my books had made a remarkable impact on her. Her letter arrived on the day that I had been her letter arrived on the day that I had my stunning realisation that I was not only connected to that runner some 30 yards away from me, but to all humanity as well. The letter from Mariam Abdullahi in Iran helped me to see that we are all connected as humans, regardless of the boundaries and divisions we have drawn to make us believe the contrary. Marion wrote in detail how important my words were to her. And she said, and said that there was a growing awareness within Iran of the need for people to stop hating one another and come together with the rest of the world. She began to write regularly and arrange for gifts to be sent to our children, tapestries that now hang in our, in our home, books about peace and love, she showed us there was another aspect to the people who were caught in that vicious cycle of war. One Friday afternoon, I received a long-distance telephone call from Tehran, and there was Mariam, weeping in joy over some of the audio and videotapes I had sent to her, along with other gifts from this part of the one song. We have since become friends, talking by telephone, periodically, and she tells me that words I wrote and tapes made several years ago are now having an effect on people who speak Farsi. The oneness of it all again hit me dramatically, and then a beautiful letter arrived demonstrating anew the university, the universality of us as human beings. Listen to Marion as she writes from the other part of our circle, and realise how impossible it is to choose up sides on a circle. Rain. It was November 20th, two weeks ago. I was a little tired of working for one week and wanted to rest. My mum. Get ready, the guests are coming. Oh, I'm tired. Tell them I'm not home. No, this time is different. Get ready as soon as possible. I didn't know what was going on. The bell rang. I opened the door. My niece came. In her hand, I couldn't believe it. My package. Oh, how long I've been waiting for it. Aunt Miriam, this is for you. My brother had got the package and didn't tell me anything about it. I kissed the box lots of times. After a while, my sisters, our friends, relatives came. What's the matter tonight? I asked. They wanted to take part in this celebration. My mum had invited them. They were, there were about 30 people at this party. I told my sister, Oh, Layla, what did I tell you on Tuesday? On Tuesday... I'm stumped by Layla. That was the name of the roomie card. Okay. How did we skip so many pages? Okay. Wow. What happened there? I said the word Layla, and that took me to the last roomy card we had. And um, where, where did it go? I only turned the page. They wanted to take part in this celebration. My mum had invited them. They, there were about 30 people at this party. I told my sister, oh Layla, what did I tell you on Tuesday? 
On Tuesday evening, my sister and I had gone to buy some meat and milk. One can hardly get meat and milk at 7pm, but we had to. On our way, I thought, to my, I thought with myself, oh, if we will get meat, it means that I will get my package, but if not, oh no. This we call intention. I was afraid to intend, but what about the risks that Wayne Dyer talks about in his books? You are very lucky. All our meat is finished. This is the last. Eight kilograms and 400 grams. You are very lucky, the man said. We wanted eight kilograms. Oh, Layla, I'll get my package for sure. When I told people that Dr Wayne Dyer had sent me a video, everyone said, that time you were lucky to get your package, but this time you won't get it because they'll open it and won't give it to you. Oh, I kiss. Must come here to make a list of worries such as if they arrest my son on the street and take him to the front. If today is our turn to be killed by Iraq bombs or if I don't or if I won't get my package. Layla, I got it at last, I told my sister and kissed the box. Open it, people said. No, after cake, I said. Mariam describes her emotions after examining all the contents. She closes her letter with the following. Listen, everybody, let's hear his voice, OK? Suppose that he is here. We listen to you on the tape. Either get out there and take charge of your life and be a responsible person and make things happen or be one more of the kids in the orphanage. I have found that anything is now possible for me only because I believe I can do it. My work really reflects the notion that you become your expectations whatever you expect to become. What a good night it was. I never forget it. It was two in the morning. OK, guys, go home. I have to wake up at 5.30. No, they say. We haven't seen such a happy face, such a real genuine laughter, such sparkling eyes for many years. My brother-in-law, I bet you won't... I bet you don't sleep tonight and read the letter over and over. OK. I bet you don't sleep tonight... And you read the letter over and over and listen to the cassettes. Thank you for making some moments in my life, moments to remember. I enclose some photos. Please send photos as much as you can. The more the better. Is it the disease of more? The scartles? I think therefore I am, Mariam. I have a letter from Dr Dyer, therefore I am. Very grateful to you for sending me the book and also wish you happy holidays. Love, Mariam. Right, I totally, I, I kind of got that. <laughs> I don't want to go back and read it. This is a tough chapter to get my head around, to get out, and to, um... That's amazing. So, basically, it was saying that all her family come around. Okay, if the meat was available, then she knew that her package would come. They were kind of saying, oh, it was you were just lucky last time with your package. But then the package came because the meat was there, the exact amount, well, just a little bit over how much they wanted. Perfect. And then there's like this celebration. By chance, they listen to the Wayne Dyer tapes and they're absolutely besotted by his energy. And they're kind of mocking her, saying, I bet you don't sleep. I bet you keep re reading that letter that you got from Wayne and listening to his tapes. Wow. Okay, we're just going to finish this a little bit. And um, we'll leave the next part for the next session. So we can begin to fathom the potential, the potential magnificence of seeing the oneness of it all without threatening our individuality. We can allow ourselves to feel genuinely connected, knowing that our thoughts, feelings and behaviour impact on everyone, even on those whom we have never seen. Each of us is a whole composed of an endless number of particles of life and each of those life particles going inward continues ad infinitum. The reverse is true as well. When we shift from the microscopic point of view to the telescopic and see ourselves as part of one life form in a larger and larger being which is oneness. The great parable on this subject is Gulliver's Travel wherein being in Lilliputian or at Brogding, oh, Brogdingnangian, <laughs> is a matter of perspective. 
Let's take another look at the entire business of oneness and how it applies to your individual body. And that will have to wait for another day. Okay, oh, not too bad, 35 minutes, perfect. Have a great day, guys. I hope you can digest that and um, we will move on in our next session. Okay, take care. Much love. Bye for now.